everybody. Thank you for joining me. I'm really, really happy and honored that you took time out of your Saturday to join me here in my studio. And I'm hoping to deliver better content as time goes on and trying to listen to what you guys want. So that's why when I ask you for what your challenges are, not only for you, but like if you, if you have a challenge for me, I'm interested because every challenge that you, every, everything that is challenging to you, I'm almost sure I have also had that very same challenge. Um, and as much as I appreciate your compliments and you like my paintings and things like that, I just want you to know I'm, I'm just an average artist. I'm, I'm nothing special. Um, I struggle just like you. I work hard just like you. Uh, you know, we're all kind of in the same boat. That's the way I look at it. And that's why, um, the only thing that's happened in my past that I, that really makes me want to share everything I know, like there is nothing that I wouldn't share with you guys. The reason is because I struggled really early on. I didn't have a lot of support. And I think that that has motivated me now. Um, I've been working as an artist for 30 years. And so if there is anything I can help with, I want to help you because I don't want to see people struggle the way I did. I wasted literally 20 to 30 years um, where I, I could have been so much further ahead. And I just, and you know, life is short. I've said that before. I want you guys to have as much information as you possibly can so you can like cut your learning curve down to like a sliver instead of decades. There's no reason why any artist should have to suffer to get this kind of information, but it's not that easy to find. So, okay, so what are we doing today? Um, it's it's uh, uh, four feet, um, four feet across here, four feet across here. So we've got eight feet by four feet and this is Arches oil paper. And uh, so it's large, it's large scale, yes. And um, so one of the things I wanna do while I'm doing this demo for you is I want to answer some questions that are kind of like the most, the top five most commonly asked questions. One of them happens to be, how do I work larger? Okay, so um, one of the things that happened while I was preparing for this live stream on YouTube was I, I started to think, okay, to deliver this information, um, I, I want to make sure that you get this the information that you need if you want to work large scale. So basically, I have set up my palette here, and the next question, another question, another top question is, well, what colors do I use, right? So I know the tendency for a lot of artists, uh, not necessarily beginner, I mean, you could be an advanced artist, but you know, like what colors do you start with, right? So I thought about that, and I um, I decided that I'm working with a limited palette, and I only have, if you can see my palette here, and I'm actually going to, after this live video, I'm going to actually um, repost this video with some close-ups, because I know it's hard for you to see. But just so that you know, um, I'm going to just hold the swatch up. Don't worry if you can't see it. Um, yeah, it's, what this is, is the colors that I'm using today. Now, this looks like a ton of colors, doesn't it? But there's only three colors plus black and white. And I, when I did the swatch, this is called a swatch, and I encourage you all to do this. Um, it kind of made me feel like, wow, maybe I have too many colors. It's, it's a lot. And, and the way that you get so many variations here, um, and so you know what I'm using, I'm using cadmium red deep, that's over here. I'm using Payne's gray in the middle. And then I'm using transparent earth yellow over here. And then what I've done in addition to these main colors, which is the cad red, paint gray, transparent earth yellow, all the other colors you see are tints, tones, or shades. So in order to understand what that means, you kind of have to know the language. It's the visual language, and that's what I teach. I do have an online course, and a lot of you who are on this call are in my online course, so thank you for joining me, and you will kind of know what that means. Um, so that's the first thing I did, was I started to think about a limited palette, and then I tested it, because I didn't want to get on live, live YouTube here and not know what I was doing. So the first thing I did was this, okay? But then, that wasn't where I stopped, right? Because I wanted to get more of a feel for like, well, what can I do with these colors? So Here's a close-up of, uh, you know, the um, more variations, right? So 
So basically what I'm doing here is I'm taking those three main colors, the cadmium red deep, the transparent earth yellow, and the Queen's gray plus black and white. And you can kind of see, uh, just glancing at this, that you're going to see um, value differences. You're going to see a lot of grays, um, the tints, tones, and shades, all the things that I teach in my course, because that's what you get. You, you can do this with one color plus black and white. If this is three colors plus black and white. So actually, look at it, it's, there's a lot of color. So for those of you who wonder like, what color should I use when I, uh, when I paint, I think it's important to understand that you can get a lot with just a very small number of colors. It could be two colors, it could be one color, one color is a monochromatic palette, two colors can be any combination, it could be a complementary palette, it could be a carbon analogous um, color scheme. So. Anyways, those are just little things I wanted to, to add. Also today, I'm gonna to be uh, talking a little bit about collage. What I'm working with today is Colbeck medium in a while, but I also want you to know that almost everything I talk about except for the technical aspects uh, is gonna to apply to acrylics, watercolor, you could be a, a colored pencil uh, artist, you could be you know, just a traditional oil painter because a lot of what I'm talking about is process. So I don't, you know, even though I'm working in full wax medium and oils, uh, and that, that is what my demos are done in, in my course, uh, I want you to know that if you're an acrylic artist, um, I'm going to be talking about a lot of things that apply. It doesn't matter what medium you work in. I, 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 I work in four mediums, and my process applies to all four mediums. And for those of you who wonder how to get a cohesive voice, it's treating each medium uh, the same so that whatever you love, you have to figure out how to make that medium comply with your needs. It's not the other way around. When I was younger, I would, when I was doing watercolor, I would kind of like, okay, what does watercolor want to do? What does acrylic want to do? What does collage want to do? What does encaustic want to do? Well, they all have their pros and cons, but it's not what the medium wants to do. It's what you want the medium to do for you. That's why it's really important to figure out what it is that you love about the art you create, because once you know that, and it, it is um, a journey, it doesn't happen overnight. In fact, it's a lifetime, it's a lifelong journey. I go through this daily, and I expect that I will for every day that I paint for the rest of my life, um, the journey continues. You never get to the end of your journey, and if you did, it would be like, you know, that would be pretty disappointing. So, um, okay, so again, I will talk about collage, um, talk about colors, and working large is, um, it's, it's just uh, very doable, okay, because imagine, this could be on your floor. And you can put plastic down, drop cloth in your living room. I used to work in my living room. I've worked in a lot of different types of studios. And yeah, I seem to be pretty lucky now because I have space. But believe me, I've had people ask me, well, have you ever worked in a cramped space? Absolutely. And I worked on like a four foot by six foot thing. Um, very cramped space. But anyways, this is on the wall. This is artist paper. A lot of people ask me, how do you attach your, I think it's a cradle panel. But actually, this is paper. And if you saw my mistake video where I made a mistake in measuring, um, my intern Joey helped me to make sure that these are now square. There's a seam down the middle with white tape. They're two 48 by, well, actually they're 51 by 51 inch panels, so that makes it about 4 feet by 8 feet. Um, scaling up means that everything scales up, not just the surface, but also the massive quantities of everything. So because I'm working polarized medium, now if you were working at Phil, it would be the same deal, right? But this is how much polarized medium um, that I've mixed up. And I also have some backup polarized medium in case I run out. And I mean, here I've got a pile of white, a pile of um, my, my uh, paints gray, my cadmium red medium deep, sorry, cadmium red deep, my transparent earth yellow. And I happen to make one, two, three, four, five piles of gray. So if you're in my course, you know why I did that. Um, it's, it's, I wanted to have it on hand. I didn't want to be mixing while you're watching. So um, I'm just going to get started here.
And, you know, uh, if you've watched any of my videos, you know that I, I love to make marks. Um, and I want to explain why I make marks and why I start in this way. Um, because this is a brand new sheet of paper, we all have this thing about white paper, like, how do I get started? It's, it's so hard, right? But it actually isn't hard. And, you know, the reason why I, I don't have any problem showing you what I'm doing right now is because you can't make a mistake. There are no expectations. There is, you can't do anything wrong. So that's the beauty of the stage. So what I'm doing right here, I've gathered some of my favorite mark making tools. And as you probably already know, um, I, I list all my favorite tools at my artandsuccess.com website. You just go to resources and they're all there. And the reason they're there, and I started it because it was so easy for me to find them. And I thought, well, you know, that's that's pretty awesome because I just have to go there and click the link and I can order it. So basically, when I mark me, I'm not, I'm not thinking, okay? So, and sometimes I'm not even really looking. And what happens, especially when you're working with a scale like this, is see how, like, the movement is very important for getting a feel for, like, space. This is so much larger than the way that, you know, you work on a little five by seven inch um, sheet of paper, right? So it, it's, a, it's a different feel. And I need to, like, I need to examine this real estate here that I'm going to be living with for a pretty long time. And I, I don't need to be even looking at the, the paper. You don't have to be looking. You just have to be doing. Okay, so part of the fun of this is if you saw how it started white. It's just white paper, right? And this is just a chunky charcoal here. And charcoal, um, charcoal really does smear. And some of you ask, well, what about your marks? Aren't you worried about them smearing? No, because what's wrong with the smear? I don't care if it smears. Um, not at this stage, because you know a lot of paint can go over this, right? So right now, I'm just trying to get a feel for space. And I want to get to know the surface that I'm going to be living with and painting on. So I do like to change up my materials um, you know, a lot. So that was a chunky charcoal. This happens to be a little crayon. Um, again, you know, it's fun to do things that are like, you know, super huge like this, like using all of your arm movements and then do something really concentrated like this. And um, I could say that, yeah, I sort of try to um, maybe avoid dead center. I've got a seam down the middle. It's just that I know that if I put something really dark there, it's going to... Um, it's going to have to be dealt with later. Another one of my favorite things is this Windsor & Newton Black. Um, I, and by the way, before I did this live, um, I prepared my RNF pigment sticks as well as this Windsor & Newton Black because it has a skin on it, and if I didn't do that, I'd be wasting a lot of work time. But look at how juicy this line is. Just by adjusting the amount of pressure I put on this, um, it's a very luscious and dark, I just, you know, I have one of my favorite things here. I, mean, I could use an art attainment stick too, and I will later, but for now, I just want to show you that this is a beautiful line. And also, you whatever scene you have in your work, just ignore it. Don't even pretend that it's not even there. Uh, because um, you want to treat whatever it is you're working on as if it's one. Okay, so then I also like to take my charcoal. And what I did, I just had these little co cosmetic puffs and put my charcoal in here just to have a little bit larger surface to work with. I like this as well because, um, yeah, it's going to smear, but I like the edge quality. I like the value differences. Notice how light this value is, and value is how light or dark something is. So here it's really light, here it's getting darker. And uh, I can even, like, you have a dark mark here, and it makes sense for me to maybe add some dark right near that, just to kind of group my values together. And so, you know, just, again, this is a very large surface. This is probably one of the largest surfaces I've ever worked on, so I have a lot of material, a lot of uh, area to cover. 
Here you can get you can use a paper towel too. You don't have to use these little cosmetic hooks. Um, but just kind of have fun with it. And I'm gonna grab a paper towel. So again, when you work large, everything gets larger. So cosmetic puff might have been fine for five by seven, but now I think I need a paper towel to cover, you know, like really juicy stuff here. And also when I get to these marks, this is that Windsor Newton black foil color. Um, I like to I like to smear it. I also like to use my hands a lot. It just kind of puts some bubbles into the, the palm of your hand, is different from your fingertips. And you just kind of get to really bond with your surface is what's happening. And and I do love marks. So now if I didn't love marks. And some of you might do realist painter. Nobody says you have to start this way. I'm just showing you my process. If you're a realist painter or you know you love a certain thing like landscapes, you don't have to start with marks. You can start with whatever you want. But again, this is how I tend to start. And especially when I'm working large, I feel like I have to get to I have to get a feel for like the amount of space. This is a lot of space to cover. Okay, so then it's like, you know, when the mark making is over with, you can, a lot of times I will stand back and, you know, take a look. And the other thing I did before this live video is I did, I did um, 12, like, practice paintings or four, four, before we're here, which you can't see. Um, and I just did that because I wanted to get to know the palette. So that's another really good thing you can do. So now that I've um, basically done the mark making, I can always return to that later. I also have um, all my paints on this tray, and you can't really see it from where you are. But just so you know, I've got Arnold pigment sticks already ready to go. Uh, I could take some of those and just add a little bit of color. Here's my indigo. And then here's my red. Deep. These are Arnold pigment sticks. Um, they're wonderful. They come in you know, a lot of different sizes, but um, this is just a really nice one. Right now, it looks you know very much like the black, but it's actually made with um, uh, ultramarine blue, and you won't see that for a while until I maybe add some white to it. But here's the cadmium red D. You can add color. Again, I've got a limited palette, so I'm fine with using these. Colors now because I think they're going to be fine with the palette. All right, so now the other thing I told you I was going to be working on is um, layers. So mark making number one, and then layers. Uh, sometimes in workshops I will put um, just a layer of full wax medium over the marks. They kind of lock them in, and you can kind of see what uh, what smears and what doesn't smear, and I'm fine with whatever smears. But you can see like. There's not a whole lot of smearing going on. So I put it on, but then I can take it off, right? So I put it on and I can I can just move it on. So yeah, I could do that. And I could cover the entire surface. But I don't I'm not gonna do that this time because it really, you know, that's a choice you make, it's an individual choice. Um, I think what's happening is you know, it could make the surface a little darker, you get a lot of unexpected effects and things like that. But uh, maybe what I'll do is just show you how I would work in some collage paper. And I'm just going to add it in here. All right, so I'm going to keep that in this cold wax medium. If you're working with collage paper on a cold wax medium at little painting, a lot of people are like, well, how do I do that? You need to have the oil underneath it. And I made this discovery that I wasn't aware of before, this uh, live stream. And so I just want to share that with you because um, in the past, I've talked about PDA size. And uh, this is just rice paper. So if you're going to collage into a cold wax medium and oil painting, it, the thinner the paper, the better. I've heard people talk about tissue paper and gold leaf and things like that. Those are great because they're super thin. Well, rice paper is also very thin. And so um, in a previous video, I used store-bought collage paper, but I love to make my own. So I did make my own. And you can see this is crazy, but 
I did use stencils, but I used spray paint. It's an acrylic-based spray paint. So because it's on this paper, I coated both sides with Liquitex Clear Gesso. Um, it's on my in my resource section because it's it's not that it's hard to find, but I think Liquitex makes a clear gesso. There might be one other company that makes it, but it's not not every company makes that. I don't think Golden makes a clear gesso. Anyways, the reason I did clear is because now you can see the mark. So I I just want to show you that I made a couple different papers here. So this was acrylic on rice paper. And I just coated both sides with the uh, the gesso. It dried really fast, and any wrinkles that I had actually came out. So I'm really happy. This actually was spray painted on there. So um, let's see. I might just grab maybe this one here. I thought it'd be fun to like try and incorporate some collage paper into this. And I wasn't gonna like you know take the whole thing. So you can share it, obviously. And then you want to just make sure you've got enough uh, cold wax medium underneath. So here's my big spatula. Just make sure you've got plenty underneath it like this and just really mush it around. And there's a lot, a lot on there right now. So um, you're just gonna, you don't like this um, the so I'm gonna tear that off and just kind of add that here. And you're going to press it into that cold wax medium. Now, because there's clear gesso, it's very receptive to cold wax medium, which is underneath it, right? And then I'm going to take my master nice and that's what this is called, by the way. It's a silicone gold scraper. Uh, you can, what you want to do when you put collage paper on there is. Make sure there's enough cold wax medium underneath it so you're gonna like do that. And then you know, make sure that all the edges are, are nice and secured down. Go over again, you can sneak some underneath that if you need to. But I tested this out and it seemed to work quite well. It doesn't, you know, the next thing you might come in and need to add a little bit more, but basically I think by treating it with the clear gesso. You're going to get a little bit better adhesion than say if you didn't use the gesso because the gesso is very absorbent. Work with it until you get the bubbles out, work from the center out like that. Okay, so I'm really just trying to um, really with this, I think today I'm just trying to show you some different methods that I use to get things going. So, mark making is one of them. Okay, so there's the collage paper. And again, you want to kind of, uh, with the next day, come in and make sure that all the edges are secure. You can always get more of wax medium. Also take the excess off like that. All right, so another thing is um, I've cut some stencils here. What, again, when you work large scale, everything has to scale up. And so what I did is I kind of, you can kind of see how these were cut. It's like a big sheet of newsprint. You can see how they fit together. I can't see it all that well, but so there, that's how they fit together, right? It doesn't mean that I have to necessarily um, use them together, but I thought it'd be kind of fun to try that. So again, just to cover some area, and I, I love shape. If I didn't love shape, I probably wouldn't be working this way. So again, it matters what you care about. And it's not about doing what I'm doing. It's like, you know, I've spent 30 years figuring out that what I really care about um, is shape. So even though I'm working in cold wax medium, and even though this medium is really great for texture, it's not that I don't like texture, but I think that um, texture is pretty easy to get in cold wax medium. It's a little harder to get shapes that you love and that you care about. So again, you have to kind of, um, your tools have to scale up, and let me just try to take some of this transparent yellow and put quite a bit on there. And I'm just going to start to make this shape. And you know, even though it's kind of popping up here, you you go from the newsprint to the center of your shape like this, okay? And you can put it on thickly, but then of course you can lift it. Notice that it's just a beautiful transparent color. 
in my palette, I have both transparent and opaque. Cadmium red deep is an opaque. How do I know that? Partially from using it, but also because right on the tube, it says so. And most brands of paint are going to tell you that, whether it's transparent or opaque. Um, in the case of cadmium red deep and gambling, it's a gambling paint. Put your red on the tube. That is, uh, cadmium red deep is, is opaque, and this transparent red yellow is transparent. And the paint's gray is, um, I think it's semi transparent. So I kind of got um, a variety, which is what I wanted. You're going to Probably have better results if you combine, uh, pick it like an opaque and a transparent, that is to say two transparents and two opaques. Because transparency and opacity is one of the characteristics of color, as well as saturation and hue, that you just don't want to miss because they're, they're really important. So if I want to make a shape, it's going to move on a little bit, but where I'm holding it, you know, I can actually cover quite a lot of. Area. Um, again, you can kind of mark into that and lift. So, this is how you get more of a specific shape. And it doesn't even mean that the shape is going to stay here because I can obliterate it later. But I'm just trying to think about the amount of paper I have here. I have a lot of surface area to cover. So I'm just trying to get something going. And now I don't have a stencil, but I can just be free for it, right? So you want to make sure you've got plenty of paint mixed up so that you don't just run out midway and then have to stop and then kind of lose your momentum. So I've used it here and I could use it again. So I will save it. I'm not going to throw it away. And there's some, it's not a perfect sense. You can see where it kind of um, bled underneath here, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. There's some other stencils here. So this one. I'm sort of into circles a lot, so I might try and put some circles on here. And, and even when your cold wax even gets a little dark, don't see all the graphite and things. Whoops, it can be used again. Just mix it, combine it with a darker color, and you can find. So if I mix the red, and I'm ready. I spend a lot of time mixing color, getting just that right value. It's all kind of about, for me, it's all about, well, what, what haven't I done before? What can I try that's new and different? So that I don't get bored. And so I can take like, this freezer paper and just put it like this. And I just mix this puddle of this really beautiful kind of maroon color. And I can sort of press it in here. Okay, so now you can see that color. And maybe I'll put your center over the center is. Then just press it. You can use a grater, but you don't have to. And then what happens if you just you know slide it down? What happens then? That's kind of an interesting mark. I like this uh, this edge quality, especially since this is a hard and sharp edge. Um, all this time to do my fingerprints. <laughs> But you know, then you can go back into it and just keep pulling it down. How far can I make this paint go? use that again. I can go back into this, but my, the way I like to think about it is if I'm going to go back into that, I want to change it. So right now, it's pretty dark. I don't mind how dark it is. Um, I think I'll go a little bit lighter. So I've got all these grays mixed up, and I'm going to just take some, this is like kind of a lighter gray, and I'm going to take it over here, mix this up, and this is really going to change 
this color. I either like it or not like it. So if I don't like it, I can change it. Right now it's kind of, as you can imagine, if you add white to a maroon, it's kind of a, um, hmm, a very grayed mid-tone pink. And I might be okay with that. I might not be okay with that. But that's where you know your sense of color comes in. And so if I want to change it, because I don't have to take that, I can add a little bit more of this transparent yellow, just right here. So go a little bit more red and yellow make orange. So now it kind of warms it up a little bit. I think I like that better. Add a little bit of that transparent color to it. And that stir it really well. Stir it. Um, I'm going to mix it really well. Okay, now I could, uh, I could just do the same thing I did before, but I could also, I was talking about those dots, so let me try that. Um, we came on later, just um, to let you know, there's, um, there's a giveaway, and it has to be, you have to submit a question or a challenge on the link that's either in the description or the comment box when this live video is over. Uh, please like and comment below. Please subscribe to my channel. I appreciate it. Let me know that you're there and that you're enjoying this type of um, content. And you know, if, if enough of you kind of like this sort of live stream, I will do it again, probably on a Saturday, because I kind of did a little poll, and that's what people seem to like. So now, I've got some paint over here that's kind of holding the stencil in place. I'm really not doing anything more. Wait. And depending on how I hold this Messermeister, I can actually, I can put it on. I can put it on like this and get good coverage. But maybe, maybe that's okay for one circle. But maybe I don't want to do that for them all. And here's one that's just over white paper. So what can I do with that? I'll show you some different varieties of ways to manipulate the paint. Let's just get it on there first. Okay, so now it's kind of sticking to what was underneath it, right? And yeah, I could go back into that same color, but I could also change it. So maybe I don't want that very same dusty pink. Maybe I want like a pop of red. I can take this and come right here. That's a bit of red. I guess when I go back in for paint, I don't feel like I want to do the very same thing again, so I'm just trying to change the colors. So I'm just going to make another change, add a little bit of this um, paint spray, make it darker. This whole idea of layering, um, it is a process because you always want to be thinking like, um, I mean these are circles, but what if I took some let's see, newsprint, And I've got a cutting mat over here. So I'm going to cut a real quick thing here. So I cut some strips of paper. And let's say that I, um, I'm a little bit wide. I'm going to tear this um, down like that. stuff underneath it to stick. And if that's the case, all you have to do is add some cold wax meat and whoops. Like that. So the cold wax medium is kind of like the glue. Just to hold your, your strip in place.
You only need it to stay there long enough to get the paint on there. So maybe what I'll do here is I'll go light. I'm going to take um, a light gray. I don't have one yet. And just go over here. You're going to get some smearing because I'm really working wet into wet here. And I like to see how far I can go with that. But at some point, you know, you don't want to make a ton of mud, so it's kind of good to just know when that point is and just let your painting set up a little bit. But notice how you can get some, you know, just because you have a shape, let's see here, tweezers or something, here we go, tweezers. Sometimes it's hard to see where the paper is. There we go, okay. So that'll be some stripes. Um, and you have this little piece of paper, you can actually go like this. Turn it around and make a little mono print like this. Then we'll make a white strip there. Um, the beauty of a cold wax medium, for those of you who um, either use it or if you maybe want to try it or whatever, um, it's just a wonderful medium that you can get lots of texture and you need lo a longer time to work with it. Um, acrylics I love too, but you know they dry up a little faster and. So let's say that you put some paint on here, and that's a, a very light value. But when you lift up the paper, you can see that you know it shows because this value compared to the white paper is a little bit darker. So I'm going to keep going with this and put some dark. So I'm kind of aware that, <laughs> it's funny, like a lot of times I'm not aware, but I feel like this is kind of midway, this kind of peripheral, peripheral vision. So I think what I'm going to do is just like this, and stop there. Make a sharp edge like this. These silicone tools are wonderful for this medium because I love geometry, so that's the other thing that I enjoy, you know, in terms of shape. And, that kind of thing. So if I want that kind of an edge, that's how I can get it by using these tools. So now I don't really have just this plain transparent or yellow. Maybe I'll just do that down here. I don't really want that white line in there, so I just do that. Okay, so you get the idea. Um, maybe down here, I'll put more of this color. You can also mix on the paper. You don't have to mix only on palette. So if I add some mid-tone gray here, you can move it around. Get some interesting marks. And there's that, this black line, you see it's still there. But I can also re-emphasize that. Maybe I'll take my art up and stick and just, you know, there it is. There's also like experimenting with thick and thin. So maybe that's kind of thick. And then can I just grab this dark? I 
been missing on the paper. Keep changing directions. And again, these are not going to be perfect circles, but I don't want them to be perfect. <laughs> this thing about perfection, I'm, I'm never going for perfection because um, that's just not my, my goal. I don't, I don't want any of my work. It, I would never have that problem anyways. <laughs> Nothing in mind is going to be perfect, and that's fine with me. I don't even think, I don't even know what perfect art is, I guess. I'm not sure what that means. I think it's perfect if you, if you feel like you want it. That's what perfection is for me. You can also like draw back into these like that, make marks. So you get the idea. So I'm going to take this off. And, you know, there's some paint on this side. So I could actually, I could turn it around. There's not going to be a whole lot coming off of here. So it's kind of, um, I can tell the paint's not real thick. But, you know, you can mount it onto the surface like that. And, you know, it'll leave some marks, but again, not much. You can also reuse these stencils, though. So you will dry, and then you can just keep reusing them. So I cut this other one. Oops. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do though because I know I won't get terribly far on this painting today while you guys are watching. So I was thinking that I would grab um, quite a bit of this. Uh, I'm going to take some of this dark. This is just like a squeegee. But I was doing some experimenting the other day, and I was having kind of fun with um, some really broad marks. So, and it's kind of strange because I'm not standing back, and normally I do all the time. But I might want to kind of catch this here. This But I also get that nice sharp bed, and you can see where it's going over the collage paper. When you mix a color with gray, you get a tone. If you mix it with white, you get a tint. And if you mix it with black, you get a shade. So a lot of you um, out there are in my course right now, Powerful Design and Personal Color. And I just want to tell um, those of you who are, if you're thinking about the course and you haven't signed up yet, I'm, I have a special going until the end of August. And all you have to do is go to, it's www.loveyourart.com and you can get 25% um, off, so that's $150 off the price, and that's good till the end of August. So I just wanted to let you know that if you're thinking about it, um, now's a good time, and I have, like, there is only, I think, like, 10 coupons available, so if you're going to do it, Now's a good time to do it. Now's a good time to get into the course. And it's a lifetime course, so we have a wonderful Facebook group of artists that are taking it, and they like to post their work, they get to know each other. It's really a lot of fun. I certainly enjoy it. It's like over, I think it's like over eight hours of content, so of information in the course. So, um, yeah. You can take just gray. Let's see if I mix it with this. Okay. So we're coming up on 3 o'clock. 
You guys might want to let me know if uh, you want to see more of this or if you want me to start answering questions because I do have some questions that people have already submitted. I'm happy to move into that. Okay. Um, if you guys want to continue watching, just say yes or no. My intern Joe is watching the chat. I can't watch it, but he's watching. If you guys um, are anxious to leave, it's fine. Don't feel like you have to stay. Um, but if you are enjoying the messes I'm making, then I'm happy to stay here and paint. And this is my Saturday, and I'm actually very happy to be in my studio. And it's really fun to have you guys um, here, even though I can't see you and I can't hear you. But again, you know, comment. Um, you like the video, they'll just let me know that you're perhaps on another Saturday live stream. Because I'm happy to do it. I mean, it's fun. And I, I think I end up preparing more for it. So um, when I start to do it, this could be considered a pattern or whatever, but you know, I, I did these two in line, but then it's like, well, what if I if I move this over a bit, right? Isn't that more interesting than just like the same old thing, and then you know, it's like scraping it. It's like every everything I do, regardless of whether it's cold wax medium or acrylic, um, if you just you know, like I didn't, I don't know if that's going to show up through here. It's just like you make mental notes of what's happening, and then like what if these two shapes touch and form a larger shape? Because I kind of like what's going on down here. I don't know if you can see that very well, but um, this is a I like this dusty blue color. And I'm really, at this point, I have so much square footage to cover here. So this is slightly curved, and every now and then I get this um, urge to just use my hands. So um, just a way to kind of um, you can sort of dig into it. But you get this way to. Um, Feel the surface and Arches oil paper is just, I love Arches oil paper. It's just, I also love um, the ampersand panels and go back into this mark. So notice when I do that, I can make it a little darker. So I've got these circles, they're, they're one size, right? But I don't want them to be identical in size or color. So I'm going to add a bit of red to that and make it bigger. Where am I in location? Here's, here's midline. And it doesn't matter. I'm not, you know, I just, it's one of those things that I'm making a mental note of it. I can come back through these circles and so do that. I have that before. Um, yeah, just so that, you know, like by this point in this painting, I would be staying way, way back to get a feel for what's happening. It's very different when you can't stand back. And I know that that's what happens when you don't have a lot of space. So in some ways, you know, that's good too. Like maybe that's a good challenge. Is work on a painting where you don't have a lot of space because you don't always have a lot of space. Right? This is a very intense color. I didn't miss it with anything. But I do love red, so I could set up kind of this thing where I've got red there, and then there's a dark blue and a light blue, and then maybe here. I just did maybe a smaller amount like this. Why, why do you put it on if you're just going to cover it up? That's a very common question, but um, I look at it as nothing Nothing that you do is wasted. No supplies wasted because even if it gets covered up, it's part of the history, and whatever the final result is, you never could have gotten there without every single thing you did. So it's kind of like sedimentation, you know, um, how you get... Uh, how do you get a mountain, right? Well, a mountain doesn't just happen overnight. It happens because of 
um, you know, eons of years to build that mountain. And, you know, when you see that mountain, it's gorgeous. You don't say, well, only the final um, layers of cementation mattered. No, they all mattered, and that's what it takes to build a painting. All of these things, and all the little nuances um, that makes you individual as an artist. So there's another question I thought I would just talk about. Um, a lot of people have a question about personal voice, and you know they want to have cohesion, and um, kind of a, a very important topic, but it's also a very, uh, it kind of matters, well, I mean, it is very important to have your personal voice, but I will just say that, you know, if you're in a gallery situation, you're probably going to feel that pressure a whole lot more, and that's just because galleries, keep in mind, galleries are a business, and they need to sell your work. Um, now, if you're not concerned with galleries, um, then you have more freedom to explore. And I've, in, in all the years that I've taught and you know, worked with artists, and um, sometimes I'll come across an artist who's kind of young and they haven't been painting long, and you know they, they, they happen to paint some great paintings, and right away they want to run to a gallery. They get in because you know the, the paintings are good. Gallery loves their work. They might only have like five paintings. They sell right off the bat. <clears throat> and then what happens is the gallery wants to have like 10 more. Well, I want 10 more of these that they just sold. Well, that artist who's young may not have discovered what their personal voice is yet. And now they're going to feel pressure. They're going to feel like they need to do this one thing for this gallery because they don't want to, you know, they want to make the gallery happy and, and that there's nothing wrong with that. So I guess my couple things I would say with regard to galleries. Spend that time you need to spend to find who you are first, so that when you when it is time for you to find a gallery, whatever it is that's selling, whatever it is you're bringing to them, you're more than happy to make those for the rest of your life, um, or at least enough of them to make them happy and yourself happy. You don't want to be jeopardizing your growth for the gallery. And then as far as how you find your personal voice, it's really a question of um, just hours and hours and hours of playing. Playing is probably the most important of all the three stages that I go through. I would say play, which is what this is. And you can see how freeing it is. That this is when you make discoveries. This is when there's no pressure. And sometimes when there's no pressure, that's when you make the best discoveries about what it is you love. Because when you remove that pressure, you know, there's no gallery that's sitting down your neck, there's no upcoming show that you're trying to make work for. You're just, you know, playing. And literally, as I tell my students, um, it took me a whole year to start to understand what play really was because I had been so used to, um, I felt like everything I had to, was doing had to be perfect. Um, had to please others, that they had to like it. And what happens is you're very vulnerable when you paint that way because you care what other people think, whereas when you find your personal voice, you don't care what people think. That's the, to me, that's when you know you found your personal voice, and that's how I knew when I stopped caring what other people thought I stopped caring what my husband said, you know, at 3 in the morning when I was in the studio painting. I mean, he might say he loved what I was doing, but I knew that it wasn't done, and therefore I could keep going, and I wouldn't, you know, it's like, take a picture, because it's not going to be here anymore. And he started to know that, and it wouldn't matter what he said. He knew that I would probably destroy it, because I knew that it either wasn't done, and, you know, it's not enough for somebody else to love it. You have to love it. That is like, that's the ultimate um, goal, in my opinion, of what you're going after. Um, it's fine to get uh, feedback and say critiques, because critiques are very valuable. But um, it's, it's fine to get feedback, but you know, if a person falls in love with your painting and they, they want to, they tell you to stop painting on it, you know, 
you have to think, but what do I think? Because that's, that's the most important part about it. It's what do you think? It doesn't matter what other people think. So I think that's a bit of a trap. So the way to, to really find you know, that personal voice, which the, the value of that to the world is that nobody can do what you do. Um, you know, and it's okay to copy because you know, everybody copies. I think we all paint what we've seen, what we've known, you know, the museums we've gone to. It's kind of hard not to be influenced. But, but even when you copy, that can only go so far because um, you know, the reason we copy is to learn technique and, and things like that. But you're not going to be able to sustain that for very long because it's not you. You're not that artist you're copying. You're going to learn a lot. Like you might copy the impressionist and learn about color, but you're not an impressionist and you didn't live the lives that they lived. You didn't live at the time they lived. So even though you gain a lot of experience by copying, it's not sustainable. And I did plenty of paintings where I copied Leonardo da Vinci when I was young. I was so proud of myself when I did almost a, what I thought was a pretty good copy of one of his drawings of a soldier. And I just loved it. And I, I kept it, you know, it was in my portfolio. I probably even had it in my portfolio when I was trying to get into grad school. I just had it in there. You know, even though I did it when I was really young, I was proud of it. But um, I didn't continue to draw that way. But I also learned that to draw like Da Vinci, you, it, you know, you learn patience and you learn how how involved that really is to get the proportions right of a figure and all the details that you've had in the drawing and the power of observation. It's a very positive thing. There's nothing wrong with copying. I just think that, you know, if you may do it for a year. You may paint like another artist for a year, but it's just not going to be enough for you eventually. Eventually, you're going to get tired of it and say, you know, I get it. I know what they're doing, but now I have something to say. So that's why there's no, no reason not to share what you're doing. There is nothing that's original. And, uh, okay, so the only thing that I'm, like, at this close range, it's very hard for me, aside from being a gigantic mess, um, what, what I'm noticing up close is primarily a lot of mid-tones. Um, when I talk about mid-tones, what I'm talking about is, um, this is a value scale, and... Uh, so the mid-tones are kind of like the very top, say, top four. Um, I use these a lot in my workshops, and I'm headed, headed to New York City pretty soon, and I'm really excited. So if you guys are going to be in that workshop, let me know if you're on this um, live stream, and I hope that you are. Uh, but so value-wise, um, normally what I would do is i take a black and white photo of this, because that's how you see color in terms of what I like to think of um, the the bones of color, like what's underneath, what's, you know, what is about color that's really important is, is how light or dark it is or how mid-tone it is, um, because the eye tends to see that first. And so just by squinting, I can, you know, I know that cadmium red is a mid-tone, so you guys should take a photo of your painting, convert to black and white, and mid-tone, 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 dark, 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 obviously, and then the paper is as white as it can be. So I am very aware, even at this close range, like where is my white? Well, it's not in a very good location now because that's something that you work on later, but what I can do at close range is I can look at this and say, okay, um, I can see the kinds of new tones I have, what don't I have? I like to ask, what don't I have? And one thing I don't have, because right now I have a lot of color. Like almost everything I have up there is color. I don't have some just plain old gray. And I, and I love grays. Um, they don't have to have color mixed with them. They can have a little bit, but they don't have to. So here's a mid-tone gray. Can't really see it very well, but I'm noticing like here. I don't want white on the edge. So I can close this gap just with gray. I can, I can even ease it down the edge here. 
and this is kind of gradation. Um, you know, not not maybe the gradation we normally would think about in terms of say light to dark, but it, let's say it's going from gray, uh, point old gray to warm gray. That's gradation. Gradation is a design principle, and it's uh, you know things like balance, unity, and harmony, and contrast are all design principles. So then you see I've got this on the mesmerizer and I bring it back in again. So then I come back to gray. So um, gray, getting darker, with gradation. And then I bring back that color, but maybe I come back this time and I grab a darker gray. Again, I'm a big fan of grays because I love color. But when you love color, um, the way to make color really stand out and let people know that you are color is to understand how to use what color is not. It's that thing where if you have too much of a good thing, it's not good anymore. And uh, I've done plenty of paintings where I had you know, way too much color. Like I love red. And I remember doing this painting, you know, showing it in my slide presentations of these poppies. And it's not that I don't love it or like it, at least I like it, but it's got a lot of red in it, and I just, you know, at that time, I was a very young artist, and I did what I knew. So, so it's okay to leave some light, because like, I can start to, um, I mean, painting to me is also like sculpture, because I'm aware of edge quality. Um, it is a flat surface, that's not like sculpture, but uh, I'm very aware these white areas really attract the eye. Um, which is the problem with texture. If you have too much texture, it may not be white and say red. It may not be white, um, maybe like, you know, the difference between this value and that, but even that is making the eye do this thing. Sometimes you just want something to be quiet. And in this medium, getting something quiet takes some effort. And uh, so a lot of times during our critiques, um, when you talk about how do we quiet an area down, you know, because maybe things got a little bit too busy. Um, again, trying to mix up the quality of edge. You've got, you know, super sharp edges. You've got this uh, amorphous edge, and this is definitely amorphous. And here's something about putting the red. Um, this is very white, so um, can I stay with these grays? I have a lot of color. I don't mind a little bit of color in my grays. I know from my um, my color chart. That I'm able to get a lot of nuances of gray. I can add just a very small amount of any color, like say this mob right here, mix in with the gray. And no, it's not the same gray as the other grays that I mixed up. A bit more. So it's kind of very dull, pinkish, mid-tone gray. So um, if you're one of those people who beats yourself up and says, oh my God, it's ugly, I can't stand it, I'm gonna quit painting, I'm gonna sell all my supplies. <laughs> um, I know I'm, I know what that feels like, um, it's, 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 it's hard. But the reason that that's happening is because um, it's the kind of thing that you're allowing your left brain. Your left brain is the analytical side, it's critical. And one of the reasons why it's very important to learn the visual language is because that language is power. That language is going to give you the ability to shut the left brain off. Um, you're kind of helpless when you don't understand the language because you can either say it's awful and it's ugly. Or you can say, wow, I have a lot of neutral tones here. I have a lot of grades. I don't have a lot of saturation. 
I have a lot of mixtures. I don't have mixture color. And that's so much more positive than saying, oh my God, it's ugly. So you're just lacking um, the other side of the conversation. The left brain knows the English language. So the only way to combat the English language or whatever the language you speak is with a different language, which is the language of art. Um, and that has to be learned. You, you know, you have some intuition, but, and I'm an intuition, I'm an intuition for decades. Um, but that wasn't enough when I went to grad school. A lot of you know I worked with Nicholas Wilson. That was a great experience, and I'm always grateful to him for what I learned. Um, but, you know, I kind of just went from there, did my homework. Um, you know, I, you can learn from another instructor. You can learn from me or anybody else, but eventually you have to figure out how to make it stick. Because you can't just listen to somebody and say, okay, I get it. Um, there's a lot of personal discussion that goes into figuring out whether what you heard rings true. Um, are you just going to believe it without questioning it? Or are you going to put in the time that it takes to make sure that, you know, are you going to own it? This is what I need to say. Okay, so right now, as you can see, I'm sorry to begin, since I get, I start to see all this white paper, and I know it's going to tone, which is great, because a lot of my paints are too high key, which means a lot of white value, and I'm just trying to get rid of a lot of that white paper, so that, now I've got this swap here, and it's very close to center, so I kind of like that, that mid-tone blue, and just take some of that, and here I had a hard edge, um, close that up, blue. It's never a problem to have things like in the center. You can always, always offset that. But again, that takes practice. Um, there are a few things you need to know to be able to do that. So I'm just putting some gray over here because gray is not the same as white. It's a little bit going down. Um, I can get any more collage paper in here. I mean, that piece over there is pretty small. Oh, I could put some dots in here. So all this paper that I, again, I made this with spray paint and it's got a, it almost feels like sandpaper, uh, but I do love dots and so maybe I can find a place to put some dots in here. I could share it. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not a big collage person necessarily. But if I'm going to do it, um, you know, it is really nice when you can make your own collage paper, more personal, and um, especially if you use a stencil or something, you know, I mean, dots are dots, but I could do this by hand, but it would just take me a lot of time to actually make this. Um, so I can put this in here, and if I have enough uh, uh, paint, so what I can do is take some of this complex medium and press Galkin gel in it, I feel like I'm explaining it, but um, I combine my cold glass medium with Delta gel because there are four reasons why. Here's the product um, here. But this is made by Gamblin, a Delta gel. And it's not like a gel, here's the liquid, the liquid, Delta, Delta, Delta light, and the gel. The reason I like the gel is because it's more like the consistency of the cold wax medium itself. It's, um, you know, it's more viscous. And the advantages of using it are that it increases the strength of the paint film. That's very important. And flexibility. That's very important. It also speeds the drying of your oil paint. So who doesn't like that? I think, I don't know, I'm really impatient. So for me, um, I like that. Speeds the drying. And then um, I'm just one of those people who doesn't really like that like it's too matte and in the end, like a little bit of um, satin. So um, the Delta gel will give you um, a little bit of satin. Okay, so there, I just clogged on a piece of paper and um, I think that's on there for good. The, the advantage of the printer gesso is that uh, 
just like you, know, you can work on the acrylic paint, but I learned that, I learned the hard way that it's good to put that clear gesso on there because um, anyone has problems of the oil paint not adhering. So um, again, hard paint is fine at any time. And the, the, the thing about these lighter areas that the marks are going to show, you know, even more. Um, uh, I can show you some Gamsol. Gamsol is a solvent. Um, you want to have good ventilation. And normally I would have a metal trash can here. I, was, I forgot to change it out. But, um, so take a paper towel and. So if you want, you know, you can either mix the ensemble with your paint on the palettes to thin it out, um, or you can just keep it here. And let's see, I just want to um, spread that a little bit and get more of a wash of that effect. Uh, a lot of people have asked me again, how do I get this to um, stay in the wall? But it's paper, so all I have is white tape, top, bottom, and sides, plus it's down the middle. Uh, so I, I mounted, it's quite a process. That you just take um, anything that's like freezer paper, shiny side like this. And so I've gotten, you know, pretty dark. And what I could do then is take some of the mid-tone red. And yeah. okay, so there's a shape. And I made it kind of this value because I've gone pretty dark here. And then you have to decide what you want it. So I've got like this is the size of my hand, smaller. I have to close that up. This is a bigger white shape. Um, I'm trying to figure out like the whites are kind of guiding the eye to this paint, even though it doesn't mean it'll stay that way, but like where would this go? Where it's gonna show up? How about here? And then you go like this. It's kind of blind because you don't put the little wax with you to see through it. I can't see through it, so um kind of guessing where it goes. It's gonna lift, you can see what it looks like, but that's a very different kind of mark. And you know, and then you got that, and so then you can not print it again. I should flip it around, and it's just like a repetition of a shape. But I don't ever like to just like take the same place. So. And then you know, there's still some more on there, so. Thank you for staying with me on a Saturday. 
and have a great weekend.